So I've got a message here today that uh, I preached up at our church uh, when, our, when our pastor was gone once, and so I uh, really like it. Um, I think it's kind of a good, just a re- good reminder. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for your, your grace and your mercy and your blessings. We're thankful for Calvary, Lord, and just uh, uh, everything you did there that uh, the, the grace of God brought down to, to man that we could have salvation, Lord. We're so grateful for it. Uh, help us, Lord, just to not forget it and just to, uh, just to always remember uh, your love and mercy for us, Lord. We don't deserve it, but you've given it to us through grace. Lord, I pray that as we... Uh, uh, spend some time in your word here today that you would just be right here with us guide us through your word uh, show each one of us what you have for it through uh, this morning through your spirit uh, just working in each one of us thankful for everybody here i'm grateful to be down here i pray that you'd be with pastor sam in in what he's doing and where he's at and just uh, uh, bless him and and uh, just this church and i'm just grateful for the the opportunity to be here lord thank you and i ask this now in the name of jesus christ amen uh, again, it is uh, a pleasure and an honor to be to be asked to come down here. I uh, appreciate it, and uh, um, you know, very um, interested in this church. And you know, my mom comes here, and so it's just a uh, little bit more personal. But I appreciate you guys inviting me down here, and uh, just wish you guys the the best, and and Pastor Sam, and just everything that's going on. Uh, so just uh, appreciate it. Uh, what I want to look at here today uh, is, is kind of twofold. One is just uh, appreciation for our pastors. I want to look at what, what uh, some of the things that, that, that the Word says about pastors that maybe we don't always understand, that we don't, maybe sometimes we forget. Uh, I think if there's somebody that's taken for granted in our Christian walk, it's probably our pastors. Um, they go through uh, a, a lot. They do a lot, a lot of work on behind the scenes, and it's uh, uh, really they're a, a huge blessing to us, the church. And I just uh, I thought while your pastor was gone, it'd be a good time to just bring to remembrance what a blessing uh, they are to us. Uh, by the way, I like your horn section you guys have added. You guys, uh, you, you do a good job, and I, I like that. So uh, it really, really uh, brings a lot to the to the service. So that's that's awesome. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, but Jeremiah chapter 3, 15 says, um, <clears throat> helps if I'm in the right place. It's Jeremiah 3, 15 says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Uh, it's just a good verse to start out with knowledge and understanding and feeding. I talked a little bit this morning uh, in Sunday school about a calling, how each one of us has a calling. Um, and how as being part of the family of God, we, we don't just get uh, brought into the family and then put aside. We have a use within that family. And one of the, the, the greatest callings that we can have is to be that of a pastor, um, to come and to be trusted and, and uh, to put in the work and the effort to lead other Christians in their daily walk, to come and, and feed them with knowledge and understanding and not just, uh, um, not just for a paycheck, not just because it's uh, uh, what we uh, you know, want to do, but the, the calling of a pastor should be, of all things, a calling um, and not just a, a, a choice. Like you would go to college and choose to get a degree, uh, the, pastor, the position of a pastor should be one of a calling. Uh, and that is, I think, getting lost today, just like a lot of other things. But I believe the position of a pastor is becoming more and more of a choice uh, that somebody decides without the proper inspiration and guiding of the Lord in that decision. Um, and it's not one that should be easily made, and it's not an easy, easy route to take. I wrote down here just a few things about pastors that are kind of uh, contradictions. Uh, a pastor must be ready with all the answers to all of our questions but he can't be a know-it-all. Nobody wants to be led by a know-it-all. He must be willing to listen to everybody's problems, but when he tries to help, he's overstepping his boundaries. He needs to love everybody, but don't get too personal. Be friendly, but not friends. I've heard it many times that a pastor uh, is one of the loneliest people in the church. They have to always be there for everybody else, but they also feel that nobody can be their friend or know that they're not anybody's friend, that they can't get too close as a pastor. He needs to see everyone else's fault, 
but overlook or accept mine. <laughs> it's easy, always easy to spot somebody else's faults, but uh, don't look too close at mine. <clears throat> needs to take care of every aspect of the church, but not be bossy. Nobody wants to be led by a bossy pastor, but they also look to him to be, uh, do a lot within the church. He has to be happy for every success in every church member's life, yet get no appreciation for the hours invested in one single message, let alone three or four a week. Anybody that's ever stood up here to, do, uh, to, to, pass, to, to teach a message, not even to be a pastor, but just to teach a message understands how much work goes into one 45-minute or hour-long message. Um, I've talked to my pastor and other people at our church, that, and it's usually, I've heard anywhere from five to ten hours of work goes into studying for one message. That's a lot, of, a lot of time to come here for an hour for people to come and sit down and then just walk away. It's underappreciated, and, and that's, I'm not, obviously I'm not complaining, I'm not a pastor, but it's something to think about that when your pastor comes up here to, to teach and to lead, all of the effort that's gone into it throughout the week, throughout the months, throughout the years. It's not something that just simply goes by day by day, week by week, just kind of going. It's something that is a calling and that you put your heart into for and as long as you have that calling. You hear sometimes, and I don't think around here, but sometimes it's kind of funny how uh, you'll see a preacher out at a golf course or something and say, man, it must be nice to only have to work a few hours a week. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem at, at any of our churches around here, but again, it goes back to being that a pastor by a choice. Oh, boy, boy, you know, it must be nice to go work on Sundays and then have the rest of the week to play golf or sit out on the patio and read the Bible or whatever, you know, drinking lemonade. Uh, a common misconception. A pastor must be compassionate and listen to complaints, but he doesn't have anybody to tell his problems to. Many of the above could be said of pastors, but it could also be said about God. How we view our pastors is an indicator of how we view God, I believe. Do we take our pastor for granted? Then a lot of times we're probably taking our God for granted. If the pastor is only here to make you feel good about yourself and telling you how happy he is to see you, and boy, does that tie look nice on you today. Or boy, that dress looks good on you today. You know, so happy you guys are here. So glad to see you. And that's good. A pastor should do that. But if that's the only reason that we come to church, it's the only thing that we view about our pastor is he makes me feel good about myself, then it's something that we need to think about. And it's also something that we need to look at our God. Because are we just, in, are we just doing Christianity for how good God can make us feel about ourselves? Can we only come to church so that our pastor can see how good we really are? We dress up to show God how good we really are. I talked this morning about knowing somebody and knowing somebody, knowing about someone and knowing them with an intimate relationship. And our relationship with Christ, as I discussed this morning, should be not just one of simply knowing who God is or knowing who Jesus is, but knowing, uh, uh, having a relationship that's, that's two-sided. We have a relationship with him and he has a relationship with us. And our relationship with our pastor should not be one-sided either. If that's all we want, and that's what God will be to us, we will never get to see what God really has in store for us, just the same way that when we come to church, we're already starting to look at the clock before the sermon's even hardly started because we have dinner waiting or a football game waiting or something else waiting for us. We won't take our pastor seriously and what he has, everything he's put into it and his calling seriously. We won't take God seriously in our lives. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the, 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 the verse, uh, the chapter about love. But there's also something here starting in verse 10 that has uh, to, to kind of do with love completed. In verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 10 says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. That gives me a, a description of what God sees in us and the way we see God. Do we look through it uh, uh, as a child, just as something to do, uh, and expect the same things from our God as a child expects? Or have we grown up to see now 
Uh, then we saw, uh, excuse me, verse 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. We know God, and God knows us. And how we act is not hidden from God. And we can have part way, or we can have the whole way. And I think Christ is saying here in, in, in the Bible that the whole way is the better way, the grown-up way. Uh, once we no longer think of things as children, but the whole way is better. When we look at Christ, we must see ourselves as the wretched, broken, dirty sinners that we are. And then, <clears throat> and only then, can we see how beautiful the blood of Christ is. That Calvary that we sang about doesn't hold a whole lot of meaning to somebody who thinks that they're already good in their own eyes. But when we recognize what we really are, then that blood that was shed on Calvary becomes a whole lot more than just a story in the Bible. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I'll read a, a good portion of it here. I'll start in verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was a, uh, ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Does that sound familiar to anybody? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into, into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. God gives us a way to do that which our flesh is not able to or willing to do. <clears throat> and if we come to church only to show others how good we are, then that's all that God's going to give us, a lot of empty tie compliments. They may sound nice for a while, but eventually they will become as empty as everything else in our spiritually empty lives. And the church will cease to be important because it stops being about me, and only I am important. Everybody knows that. I'm important. I should be number one. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, he shall, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, or Paulus, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. 
just again, a verse here, a lot of good verses here to show what we think of ourselves versus what God sees in us and what we really truly are. So I am not the most important part of the church. I shouldn't be. Once we allow ourselves to be broken by God through the Holy Spirit, using the preacher, then we can begin to appreciate a pastor because we appreciate God. The pastor is a unique part of God's plan for Christians. So it may have sounded like I was getting off track there a little bit, but again, I was going through all that to show that, that, that how we view our pastor and what we expect from our pastor and what we want out of our pastor is directly related to what we expect and what we want out of God. And when we, when we expect things for ourselves out of our pastor or out of our relationship with Christ, we're building ourselves up. And there's no room in the Christian walk for a puffed up person. And the Bible is very clear about that. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with man, or with God. If we want to become wise in God's eyes, then we need to become nothing in the eyes of the world. And how we view our pastor is a big indicator of how we view ourselves. Because it's so easy to be an armchair quarterback, you watch football on TV and you say, man, I would have done that completely different and we would have won the game. Being an armchair preacher is the same way. Man, it's so easy to be a pastor and I sure wouldn't have done things that way or I sure, you know, wish you would have done things a little bit differently, but if God has put a pastor in our church and we believe that he is God's anointed pastor for that church, then there's no place for an armchair preacher just like there's, there's no place for a professional quarterback to be told what to do by somebody who's just watching on TV. Saul was, a, was anointed by God to be the first king of Israel. There's no doubt about that. Yet Saul turned out to be crazy and, and going completely against God eventually. David was also anointed of God to be the next king of Israel after Saul. But David didn't do anything against Saul until God told him what to do. He didn't raise his, his, he was right next to him and could have taken him out. And everybody said, this guy's so crazy and you're next. You've already been told that you're next. Do what you need to do here, David. He was right next to him. And David said, I won't raise my hand against God's anointed. And I'm not saying anybody's trying to take over a church anywhere or anything, but it's so easy to talk about a preacher. It's so easy to say, I wish he would do this, or I wish he would do that, or I wish things were a little bit different, or if I were in charge, things would be different. But that man is put in God's, up here at this pulpit as God's anointed. He's a shepherd of a flock, and that's not a job that should be taken lightly. And I believe in this church and in a lot of the churches around here, that, that in my church, that, that uh, God has put anointed men in the pulpit. I'm not saying anybody's trying to take over anything, or even, not even saying anybody's unhappy. Uh, this certainly is not to be a, a message of chastisement, but just to remember that God, it's anointed, stands up here, and not to be... Uh, uh, too quick to say anything against the, the man of God, the shepherd of the flock, and just more than even saying anything against him to appreciate what he does. The calling that he has is one that not many people want to take up if they are truly called. A lot of people don't mind doing it for the paycheck, but for somebody that's truly called, it's a place of, of fear, uh, of wanting to do what's right in the eyes of God, not a, uh, you know, not a, a fear of being afraid of Uh, of preaching, but a fear of being trusted with God's flock. It should be a position of fear and and of honor and something that that, uh, needs to be appreciated and enjoyed and encouraged and helped out. And I see that here with you guys. You guys have been through a lot in the last year, and and I'm so glad to see everybody still here and and backing the pastor the way you guys have. So that's... uh, Uh, a compliment to you guys. I don't think anybody has a problem with being unhappy with the pastor, but there's also a difference with being, you know, not necessarily being unhappy with him and appreciation can be two different things. And and it's something we all take for granted. Um, I've been in the same church for a long time and there's been times when I've been, you know, unhappy. There's times I've been wondering what our pastor is doing. And I'm just thankful that, that, that we have a church and I believe you guys are a church here that, that does stay faithful to your pastor, that does back your pastor and, and, and helps him. But it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an important calling to be called of God to, to lead the flock. I mentioned in Sunday school how much work a shepherd puts into leading his flock to always make sure that they're safe, that they're being fed, 
that they're being taken care of, that they're not hurting themselves. There's a lot of strange doctrines out there. And the sheep, the flock, the church, for some reason has a tendency to stray, to stray doctrines, uh, to, to wrong doctrines. It's the pastor's job, just like it's the shepherd's job, to keep his ear to the ground. Make sure there's nothing wrong coming into the flock. There's no wolf in sheep's clothing, so to speak, trying to sneak in and do, do harm to the flock. And it's, it's, it's not an easy job. And it's, it's also a job that, that we really need to be appreciative of. Let's look at Acts chapter 20. Just some uh, good ideas in here from the book of Acts about what is expected of a pastor, biblically. Acts chapter 20, and we'll read verses 27 through 36. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, unto the, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall, uh, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Wherefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto, unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with, each one, or prayed with them. Some good verse here about, about some of the things that's expected of a pastor uh, and, and how a pastor, if anybody is interest, interested in going into the ministry, if anybody feels that that might be their calling to go into the ministry, good set of verses here to look at and to, to, to ask yourselves, are these things I'm willing to do? Verse 27, Acts chapter 20, verse 27 says, declare the counsel of God. That should hopefully go without saying as being part of a pastor, that they would declare the counsel of God. Verse 28 shows that a pastor's job is to teach others to lead with the understanding that they themselves must be led by the Spirit and that the church is no man's but bought by the blood of Christ. Too often we hear a pastor say, this is my church. This is my church. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to give up my church. I don't want to do this for my church or I don't want this to happen to my church. And the church is not a man's. The church is God's, bought with the blood of Christ. David I keep going back to David as an example, but David had at times as king when he was tested. And he, he, he was good. God was a, or David was a man after God's own heart. And he knew that the king, being the king or the kingship and the kingdom itself, was not his. And that if another man, if God had called another man to step in and, and become king, David didn't want to interfere with that. Just like he didn't want to interfere with Saul because Saul was still God's anointed and God would deal with Saul at the right time. David knew that if it was his time to give up the king or the kingdom and it was God's, God's will, he was willing to do it. David was good about not calling it his kingdom. Or, you know, that he understood who was in charge and who's king and uh, who, you know, who set kings up and who takes them down. Verses 29 through 31 show that a pastor is to give warnings of potential problems and lead by example in using preaching to avoid them. Like I said, strange doctrines that will float in. They come in in funny ways. They don't always come in like a wolf gnashing and barking and howling and ready to show itself. They, they sneak in funny ways. And it's the pastor's job to be aware and to be diligent. I believe that the diligence of a pastor is one of the things that gets most underappreciated. How diligent a pastor has to be with his flock to keep an eye on them and to keep make sure that nothing is coming into that church to harm them and to make sure that they're always being led in the right direction and being led by the word, the, the, the deep waters, the still waters of the word of God and not by outside teaching or uh, you know, any other philosophy or anything like that. Verse 32 shows that a pastor has to know how to properly use the word of God for building up and for salvation. Verses 33 through 35 show a willingness to work and to labor, 
outside of the ministry, both for himself and to help others. And again, I've talked about uh, how a pastor is viewed as only having to work a, a day or two a week. But it shows here that that is not at all God's calling for a pastor. A pastor is to stay busy, both in the ministry and if he, you know, when he, also helping others in other ways. Manual labor should be a part of a pastor's job, especially around here. We live in a rural area, and there's always people that need help doing things. Um, you know, whether it's helping somebody move, build a house, whatever the case may be, fix a car. There's always people that need help. And uh, a, a pastor's job is not just to help from the pulpit only, but it should be, I believe, more hands-on uh, if needed. I'm not saying he needs to go out and look for things, but if somebody in the flock needs help, he should be there to help out when, when needed. And verse 36 shows the importance of prayer and how a pastor, pastor's job should always be in prayer for the church, for himself, for the preaching of the word, for salvation for those that he might know that are not saved, for those within the church that aren't saved. The importance of prayer is something that a pastor is definitely ought to understand. To understand that, that the power of God resting upon a preacher doesn't just go and then stay forever and like a Supreme Court justice. It's not a, an office for life that just no matter what you do, you can't lose it. A pastor has to remain diligent in studying and in prayer and in keeping his eyes open. Uh, but prayer, the importance of prayer there in verse 36, he prayed with them. Um, you know, the pastor should be down among the people, not just standing up here aloof like the, uh, the leader of a Catholic church, the untouchable, you know, the, the holier than thou and with all dressed up and with fancy clothes and hats and jewelry and stuff like that, uh, you know, looking down on the people. A pastor should be a man who is able to, to go in and, and be amongst the people and work amongst the people and pray amongst the people. Should have a servant's heart. It's always said that, that a, a leader can't know how to lead until he first knows how to serve. And that should definitely be a part of a pastor's life is to be a servant. Uh, he has a calling, yes, but that calling includes serving others. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, I, I'm reading a lot of scripture here today, guys, and I, I hope that's okay. Um, I don't always read this much scripture when I'm preaching, but I feel these are good verses to go along with, with what I'm doing here. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. What we're talking about here does not simply end with just a better appreciation of our pastors. That's not what I want to walk away here from because uh, uh, something like that will, will fade after a while. Yes, I appreciate uh, you. Know, appreciate you. I, I got uh, preached to about appreciating you, so I'm going to appreciate you for the next two or three weeks, and then we'll go back to, to being normal. Uh, you know, that's not what I want to walk away with here. It's just a, a temporary appreciation for pastors only, but there's something more we need to look at here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Uh, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But, in, but unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, he was ascended up on high, and he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the, of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more, no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, 
from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of love, of itself in love. Understanding a pastor's role in our relationship with Christ is not the end of the line. It's not what all I want to focus on here today. We the church are a body, and the pastor is one very important part of that body, but he is still just one part of the body. That still leaves all of us as other parts of the body. Each member of the church is also an important part of that body. Verse 11 Ephesians 4.11 says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Shows that we all have a calling, and I touched on this in Sunday school a little bit. We all have a calling, a role to fulfill in this body. Again, I don't believe that this church or my church or a lot of the, the uh, uh, you know, independent Baptist churches around here necessarily have a problem with loving our pastor. But do we recognize that he is one part of God's equation and we are also a part of God's equation. Coming to church is not just simply all about a pastor. It's not just a pastor's job to come and preach. We have a calling as members of the body. Just as the pastor is a part of the body, we're part of the body. We have a calling. A body isn't just one part that just does all the work. A body works together to get things accomplished. Fingers, hands, arms, elbows, neck, knees, they all work together to get things done. One part can't function properly without the other. The way God designed our body uh, is so intricate and so amazing. From the brain all the way down to the toe. How it works together for thought and for balance and for lifting and bending and doing all sorts of things. And one, <clears throat> if anybody who's had a bad back knows when you have part of your back out, it affects all the rest of your body. So when one part of this body is not right, the whole body is affected. And that can be the body being affected by sin. That can be a bad attitude. That can be a lot of different things that come into this church and affect the whole body. So it's not just about having a better understanding of our, of our, of our pastors and a better appreciation of our pastors, but recognizing that what we all are together to do we all work together in that equation that God formed us as a body. Anyone here who is saved has a calling. This is what he is referring to in here in verses uh, 14 through 16, when he says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which supplieth every joint, or which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, every part is important, make, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about different gifts that, uh, that we're all given. Verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto the dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. We all work together as the body, but we all have the same Spirit. And there are differences of, ad, of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. We're all given these gifts to work together to profit, to, to profit the body and to glorify and honor Christ. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the same self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members 
of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course not. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? Or if the whole were, were hearing, where were the smelling? By now hath God, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. We're all here as part of this body by a calling of Jesus Christ. He's put us where he wants us for a purpose. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. If you feel that you don't have an important part to play in this, in this body, that verse should really hopefully uplift you. It seems like here that the, the ones that may seem the least important are the most needed. The ones that are needed most don't always get the recognition. They don't always get the glory. They don't always get the pat on the back saying, good job. But you're the most important. I know in our church we have piano player, we have nursery workers. You know, they put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. Probably get the least recognition. So if you're doing it just for the recognition, you're going to come out unhappy. But when you're here as part of the body, recognizing that even though you may not get a lot of recognition, you may be very needed. You are very needed. And it's part of God's body. He's placed you there for a purpose. That should help, hopefully, uplift you, not bring you down more. A lot of people say, well, I don't care about that. I want the recognition. I don't want to have to do so much work, whatever the case may be. But the point is that God has mentioned here that we are all here for a purpose. Recognized, recognition, appreciated, paid, not paid, whatever the case may be. Every person as part of this body has been called here today to be an important part of the body. And keep going here. <clears throat> it says uh, there in verse 22, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we, do, we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which, is lack, which lacked. But there should be no schism in the body. But that the members should have the same care one for another. Appreciation for the pastor is just as important as appreciation for one another. The, the roles that each one of you play within this church is important and should be appreciated and, 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 and um, yeah, just appreciated by each other. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues or do all interpret? But covet, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And then right after that it goes into verse 13 speaking about love. The most excellent, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and I show unto you a more excellent way, which is the way of loving one another. Uh, which goes far in appreciation and understanding, helping one another, the pastor, understanding what you are as a flock, what your purpose as a flock is, what your calling is within that flock. It may not be celebrated, it may not be even appreciated, noticed, but you have a calling that is important nonetheless. The little toe doesn't probably get a lot of uh, recognition or honor on our body. But without it, our balance would be very off. My mother-in-law just lost her toe this last summer to uh, diabetes. And it wasn't her big toe, it wasn't her small toe, it was one of the middle toes. And you think, 
boy, how often have I looked down at that and not even thought about it? But the time and the effort that we had to put into helping her after that shows just how important that toe was to her body, to her, to living. So some of you here may feel like a middle toe, not recognized, maybe not all that important, but you're an important part of the body. And if you were not here, you would be missed and the church would have to find a way to, to work without you that would take some getting used to, some retraining, and that is time that God has better use for. Staying together as a church, regardless of what's happening, uh, whether you know, you're not feeling appreciated or the hard work that you feel that you do that just doesn't get enough recognition or whatever the case may be, you have a calling as part of this flock and as part of this body. I have a calling as my church, as part of that body. We all work together for the same God. We all have the same calling, but we're different bodies. We're different parts. We're different flocks. But I can appreciate your flock and the other flocks that God has called, and we should all be working together for his glory and his honor. If you don't know what your calling is, maybe you're sitting here saying today, I, I don't know what part of the body I am. I don't, I don't know. Whatever you think you have, whatever you think you bring, whatever it is, I would just put it aside because what we think we have or what we think we bring is not important. But what God wants us to be in answering his true calling for us is what's important. Some, somebody here may say, you know, I, 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 I can sing beautifully and I, I sure wish somebody in the church would, would recognize that and let me do some, some singing for the Lord. Uh, or, you know, for the church, and maybe by that way get recognized or appreciated. I would just lay that down at the altar, and if God wants to use that, He can use that. But He may not want to use that. He may have another calling for, it, for, for you. Because everything that we have of ourselves, God could see completely different. What we think we bring to the church could be... Uh, uh, entrance to pride, to sin, whatever, the, whatever it may be. Anything that we think we bring to the church needs to be laid down on the altar and given to God first and foremost. So if you're not sure what your calling is, leave it to the Lord. Let Him call you. Don't try to look for things yourself because that'll only bring more of ourselves and that's less of what we need, or that's what we need less of. Less of ourselves in the church and more of Christ. At the right time, Christ will show you your calling, your part of the church. In the meantime, appreciate those around you. Love each other in your flock. Appreciate your pastor. And just keep doing what you... Being here today could be a calling. You say, man, I didn't really feel like coming today, but I decided I am. You've just answered today's calling of the Lord to be here at church and maybe be a blessing to somebody around you. It's a blessing to me. I enjoy preaching to people. I don't enjoy pre preaching to empty pulpits. I, I, I've done that before, and it's, it's a lot funner to preach to people. So thank you for being here. You've fulfilled a calling today just by coming. So you're, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever, whoever, whoever runs the sound or plays the piano, the young men playing the, the horns, have an appreciation, have a calling that they're answering to the Lord for. And, and I'm just grateful. It's how a church works. We have, our church is relatively small, and a lot of us wear many hats. And it gets difficult sometimes to keep going to church and keep doing work. But that's what our calling is. And whether it gets appreciated or not, it's not important. That's what we're there for. That's what we're doing for the Lord right now. And, if, you know, it may change. A lot of times people's callings in the Bible changed. So you may not be doing sound forever. Maybe eventually somebody else will come and do that. You may not be playing piano forever. Maybe somebody else will come and do that. It's important not to be a hindrance to the Lord, though. If somebody else does come and calls you to something else, to not let, not be a hindrance because you don't want to give up your part of the church. You don't want to give up being the middle toe. I'm comfortable being the middle toe now. I've been doing it for a long time. I don't want to go do something else. But if the Lord has somebody else to be the middle toe, then I would not stand in the way of the Lord. And uh, it does take some discernment to know that. When is the right time? What is the right, you know... Is, is this the Lord's anointed to be doing this job that I've been doing? Is it now somebody else's time or turn to come and do it? And that's something that I know our pastor is struggling with. He's, he's been preaching for 30 years. He's 75 years old. 
and he's wondering what's next. But I trust that the Lord is leading him and he's letting the Lord lead him so that he knows when the right time will be to step down and who the right person will be to take that pulpit or what will be the right place to do for the church. It uh, it's, takes some discernment and it's not just for pastors, it's for each one of us to know where we are, what we are, what we're doing for the Lord. But hopefully today we've, we can walk away from here and have a better appreciation for your pastor. I don't know how long he'll be gone, but I know each one of you are looking forward to him coming back. And uh, it's, uh, I hope you appreciate him. I hope you appreciate each other. And what, what you guys are doing together for the Lord here in Polson is a, is a great thing. It may not feel great, but it's your calling right now. So thank you guys very much. Um, I'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for your flock. And we thank you, Lord, for pastors that you've called to, to, to lead us. But, Lord, we are yours, first and foremost. And I just pray, Lord, that, that uh, through your word that we would just gain a better understanding of what you expect from us and, and what we can do to glorify and honor you and put ourselves aside and to appreciate others that you've called in, 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 in your body. So, Lord, thank you for this church. And I just thank you for Pastor Sam. We pray that you be with him and guide him through, through uh, this journey that he's on right now and what he's doing, bring him back safely. And I pray, Lord, that this church would just continue to have a heart for you and to let you lead it and guide it and each person here to, Lord, just seek your calling daily through wor- your, your reading your Bible, reading your word and prayer, and just seeking you, Lord, just to be closer to you and let the world take care of itself and our problems take care of its themselves, but Lord, just letting you take care of us and every part of us in this church. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. I ask this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.